Hello, and welcome to SoberCast, where we provide AA speaker meetings and workshops in podcast format. We're an ad-free podcast, and if you enjoy listening, please help us be self-supporting by visiting SoberCast.com, look for the donate link, and drop a dollar or two into our virtual basket. We hope you enjoy the podcast. Have a great day. My name is Denise. I am known as Michelle, and I am an alcoholic. Hi, Michelle. I remember when I first sat in this room, like, so long ago, and I was like, I'm never going to make it to be sober long enough to have to speak in front of all those people. (laughs) And here I am now, and I'm, like, shitting myself. (laughs) Um, Well, thank you guys all for coming out, and if you have one day, if you have 27, the amazing thing about this program is it's one day at a time. So however much time you have, we're all in this together. Um, As far as where I was... Uh, growing up, I came up from a very poor background. Um, I was very abused sexually, mentally, all of those things by my mother and her boyfriends. At the age of five years old, I saw my sister get murdered, and uh, I was blamed for that because I did not call 911. And so I had a pretty broken relationship with my mother soon after that. And so I grew up with the guilt of thinking that I basically, the, my three year old sister was killed because of me and so growing up you know I was I just stuck with school I was super like a teacher's pet I was totally okay with that Uh, about 18 19 I got into a relationship and it was my first serious relationship and this guy popped the question on top of the Eiffel Tower and I was like fuck you (laughs) so um, I took the ring and it was good Uh, we moved in and I started drinking and, you know, it, at first it was very casual. It was glasses of wine, few shots. And then I noticed I, I blacked out. I kept blacking out. And I was like, hmm, you know, this is pretty fun waking up in random places with no clothes on. Like, we could write our own stories. Like, you know, we fill in the endings. It was exciting. It was adventurous to be engaged and in love. And yet so lost. And somehow that was exciting, too. And, um... You know, we were very abusive to each other, and his family told me at the Thanksgiving dinner table that she refuses to have her son married to someone who will provide nigger babies. And so I kept drinking more and more, said pass the mashed potatoes, and about a week later, we broke up. Probably about a month and a half later, I jumped into my next relationship, and that's when my drinking really picked up. Um... This person seemed like everything I never was. He, he was popular, and he had friends, and he went to underground hip-hop shows. And I was so wanting to be black, cool and black. So I was like, hell yeah, niggas. Like, I'm in this bitch. And I, like, had a 40, no clue what I was doing. And blacked out again. And this progressed from drinking liquor to snorting coke to doing ecstasy and God knows what else. This went on to the point where I become very dependent on him. For example, I would sneak in through his doggy door and I would sleep under his bed. We had like, we called them S and S's and it was like sneaky sleepovers. And I would sneak in through the doggy door and I would sleep under the bed from 6 a.m. to 11 p.m. that night. And from 11 p.m., until 6 a.m. the next day, we would just go hardcore and liquor and drugs and everything else. And when we broke up, I just couldn't stop. Um, a couple years later, I, I can't say that I found a bottom that was as intense as other people's. And I never want to compare my story to anyone else's because I know we all have our own struggles. Um, I am partially blind, and when drinking, I drink like a shot, and I slipped off a curb, and the police came out of nowhere. And I was like, hey, 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 I'm blind. Like, I just had a shot. And they're like, get in the car. So um, I had been arrested for so many drunken in publics that they gave me a court date. And I prayed and prayed that they would not serve me with papers. And I got off the charges. And my therapist was like, I think it might be time for you to go to Alcoholics and Anonymous. I'm like, me? I'm good. I'm good. And then, you know, I kept drinking and it kept, it kept, you know, getting worse. And I was like, shit, they said, if you get charged within the next year, they can put these charges on you and other charges. I'm like, I guess it's time. I walked into my first meeting of Alcoholics Anonymous and I believe my first meeting was 
the Thursday night college bay. I know y'all know that. Some of y'all know that. And I was scared shitless. I remember seeing people and being like, none of these people look like me. None of these people know what I've been through. They can't, they can't compare their stories. They think they're better. The second time I went, I actually listened. And I saw strength and hope and really wanted to better myself. The first three months, honestly, I didn't want to sponsor. I was like, you know what? I can do this on my own. Like, what? You just read the fucking book, do some steps. Like, it can't be that hard. I know myself better than anyone else, right? So it wasn't going so well. <laughs> and um, I got my first sponsor, which led to a second sponsor. And now I'm in a very healthy relationship with two sponsors, Morley and Simone. And they have changed my life. They listen and they're careful and they're not afraid to push me. And I, I'm not afraid to push myself because I know if I fall, they have me. I can say that this program has given me many things, but what it's really given me is the confidence that I felt like I had when I was drinking, that false confidence, that security blanket, that, oh, I can do anything. I'm the coolest person in the room. And, you know, it's so funny because if you really know me, my friends know that, they're like, dude, that bitch is crazy. Like, she's crazy. And I'm like, and they're like, you're sober? I'm like, hell yeah. So when summing up, I want you to know that this can be an intense program, but at the end of the day, it's what you make it. And with one day at a time, enjoy your first day. Um, now I'd like to turn the meeting over to Jeremiah. My name is Jeremiah, and I'm an out-of-breath alcoholic. <laughs> Jeremiah. I just drove over here from visiting Grandma, and I had way too much fun, so I kind of lagged on leaving. And <laughs> family's an important part of my story. Got a couple of my family members here tonight. Oh, good guy. <laughs> um, <laughs> I've been planning out what to say for like two weeks, and then I'm in my car, and I'm like, I might as well get out of my way. I have places to go. And <laughs> someone was like following the speed limit on the way here. Like, who does that, right? <laughs> 25 miles an hour. <laughs> I'm really grateful to be here tonight and grateful to be able to share my story, you know, and uh, I'm grateful that I've been sober for three times longer than I drank now. And that's a fucking miracle. If anything is, um, where do I start? I have a sponsor who has a sponsor. I, uh, I kind of sponsor other people, but they've been like out and about doing their thing lately, but I stay open to sponsoring people. I, uh, I show up, I go to meetings, I call people in AA and I surround myself with sober people. You know, I surf with sober people. I go to shows with sober people. I, uh, I travel with sober people and I go through gnarly shit like deaths with sober people. Like anything you can do in life, you can do with other sober people. Because for me, alcoholism is really isolating, you know? It's like, I'm different and here's why. And uh, I'm here now. Yeah. So <laughs> I believe I was an alcoholic before I ever drank, you know? I felt different then from the gate. Like you were saying, I uh, I forget. <laughs> right away, I remember connecting with your story. Something about, oh, growing up poor. And I always had, like, well-off family members, but I also had a poor mom. And I didn't have a dad around. And I had a really important uncle around, but, you know, my dad just wasn't there. So all those things were reasons eventually to drink. They were reasons from the gate. I was like, I'm different. Little Johnny has a dad. Little... Little Sasha has can sit in school and pay attention. I should say school is a big part of my story. I was going to open with a joke, a, a thing where I apologize for school being a part of my story. Because, you know, people say that about drugs. Like, sorry, there's drugs in my share. There's that too. Lots of drugs. But for me, <laughs> drugs and alcohol go hand in hand. You know, it was like my first night... I recently had a resurfaced memory of going to the bar with my dad when I was like six and drinking. 
because I don't know. I just remember this conversation. Like, I'm not going to let him drink. And they're like, Dennis, you can't bring him in here. And he's like, oh, it's cool. He's not going to drink. And then I remember getting kicked out of the bar with my dad when I was six. And uh, yeah, but my actual first like purposeful drink was when I was like 15, you know, 14 and a half, right before, uh, right before high school that summer. I had a joint and a light beer the same exact time, hand in hand. We did the whole, like, do you want to do it? I don't know. Do you want to do it? I don't know. Do you want to do it? And finally, one of us said yes. My friend Nishant and I, you know, and uh, we were at his neighbor's house. And I remember being so paranoid, you know? Like, I didn't even get high or drunk that night. But automatically, it's like a switch was thrown. It was like, oh, I found it, you know? Like... My friend Moshe likes to say it's like getting in a hot tub and you're like, oh. and that's the feeling I got that night. And I remember like I wasn't going to roll a joint because the cops were going to find my fingerprints. And so <laughs> I only drank a half a light here, you know, but like, yeah, I was paranoid, but that took care of the paranoia. It was like, I'm cool. And I forgot early on, I usually say like everyone had a handbook for living and I didn't. And so that was kind of, I had that thing that I was missing that everyone else had, only my thing was better than your thing, you know? And it was like, I found it. And in the very beginning, my drinking was slow and I had all these rules. I'm a smart kid. I come from a family of doctors and teachers and it was like, well, I'm not an alcoholic and here's why. And drinking's a problem for my dad, but I'm different because I'm too young. Or, you know, all these different, like my uncle took me on a camping trip when I was young, and uh, right, right as I was starting to drink, and he, uh, he had heard that I was smoking weed at the class barbecue, and it wasn't weed, it was just cigarettes. That was my first actual drug drug, but uh, before that it was books and sugar, and those things are both, like, really addictive <laughs> They were both ways I got outside of myself and kind of jumping from the camping trip to the, well, I'll just tell the camping trip story first to stay somewhat linear, <laughs> but uh, Uncle Roth took me on a camping trip, you know, and he's like, I heard you've been smoking weed. And I was like, I would never do that. Weed makes you stupid, you know? And he's like, well, you know, your dad was an alcoholic and he, he cautioned me. The one one thing I love about him is he's like, be careful. I'm not going to tell you not to do it, but do your thing and just know there's this history. And I was like, yeah, 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 cool for you, but sucks for dad, but I'm good. I'm me, you know, I'm young, I'm smart, I'm different. So from the get, the gate, it was like, I'm not going to do that. I'm not going to be an alcoholic. I'm not going to be an addict. I'm just a kid. And so, uh, so yeah, early on, I had addictive, I had an addictive personality from, when I was like, can remember, since I could walk really, because <laughs> my grandma used to live in the apartment building across from mine, you know, and I would, uh, I'd run over, I'd get up before cartoons were on every Saturday, and I'd run over in my bare feet to grandma's house, she'd leave the door unlocked, and I'd come in, grandma would still be crashed out, and I'd like, turn on the TV, and the American flag would be playing. You know, the national anthem, it's like way before cartoons, before the little boop and all that stuff, and I'd just be like, I need something, you know, like cartoons. Cartoons aren't on, I need something. And I'd like start rifling around for sweets, and I'd be like, what's in there, you know? And I'd get up on the counter, and then I'd start off with whatever, and eventually it was the spoon and the sugar. And it was like, just like alcohol. It was like, I'm just going to have a little spoonful, you know? And I'd skim a little off the top. And then eventually I'm having spoonfuls, and cartoons come on, and then Grandma wakes up and makes oatmeal for me. And on the one hand, it was a really cool, fond memory of mine. I love my grandma. I love how nurturing she is. And, you know, yeah. But uh, at the same time, from the gate, it was like, give me some more, you know. And one time, my uncle Daniel gave me, gave Grandma to give to me, to give to my mom, a whole box of samples of Flintstones vitamins, and I ate them all that day. Like, all of them. Mom never saw them, and I had, like, colors all over my mouth, and she's like, have you been eating candy? And I'm like, no. And I don't remember feeling bad. I don't remember anything bad happening from that, but I just remember, like, I can't just have one. I can't just have five. I gotta keep just one more, just one more. And the cool thing is, now I'm that way with a lot of things, like surfing, you know? One more wave. 
just one more, or I'll be at a show taking pictures, and I'm like, just five more minutes or whatever. But from the gate, I've always been an escapist, you know, and, and fast forward, I have a literature degree now. That's kind of part of the punchline. But from the gate, I also read. I was tested at college level in, like, grade school. No joke. So I've always read novels, and I would just, like, be in the top bunk, in the dark, reading with the book up against my face. My mom would be like, you're going to wreck your eyes. And I have glasses now, so I guess <laughs> mom was right. But it was an escape, you know, and, and I still love reading to this day. And I fancy myself a writer a little bit. I'm also a procrastinating perfectionist. So I kind of need a fire under me to write, but when I do, there's something amazing about the writing process. It's an escape for me today. So yeah, 40 minutes is a long time, you know? <laughs> I always, I never have enough time, because it's like, how long do I talk about alcohol? How long do I talk about recovery? That's the crazy thing about being sober for 17 years, is like, do, what, which came first and what keeps going? Honestly... <laughs> Yeah, I don't know. It's 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 a trip, you know, but so I moved around a lot. Um I moved from my mom's house to my grandpa's house to my uncle's house, back to mom's house, back to I don't know, all over. I was always the new kid. I was always going to be what in, into what you're into like, oh, you like hip hop? I like hip hop. You like metal? I like metal. And you know, I'd always move to a new school. And I'd start off in gifted and talented classes, and I'd have a lot going for me, and I'd try to hang out with the outcasts and the rejects, the skaters, the punks, the headbangers, all those guys, all you guys, you know? <laughs> and I wouldn't feel like I fit in. I would either be too smart or not cool enough, and like, I lived in Pasadena for six months, and I wore the same flannel shirt every day. It was all stapled together with holes in it. And my grandpa used to have this huge mansion, you know, and I'd like go to school and I'd hear, why does he dress like that? What's up with that kid? And this other girl one day was like, oh, he's rich. He can dress that way. He wants to. And I was like, they just don't get it, you know? <laughs> and then, and I had a fake Zippo lighter because the kids I was running with were all smokers and they'd have all these crazy tricks. They could flip it and spark it and just do all the shit. And I was like, I'm going to be down, you know? And I remember I had a Debbie Gibson tape. That was when CD... It's not funny. No. <laughs> I was, like, in love with Debbie Gibson. And I remember I had this, C this... I almost said CD single, this cassette single, in my side bag one day. And I, like, left it with my friends, went to the bathroom and came back. And they're all, what's this? <laughs> I, 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 I don't know how that got there, guys. And I was, like, trying to play it off. And really, I just didn't fit in. I was a round peg in a square hole or a square peg. I don't know. But, you know, and I didn't, I didn't even smoke. And I had that lighter. And I, I learned a few tricks. But I just never really fit. And, and it was always, I've always been right on the brink of, like, doing really well, being really successful, and then just fucking losing it. And uh, so ADD is a big part of my story, too. I've been diagnosed with it. It's an outside issue, but it's not because it's directly affected my sobriety, and my sobriety has directly led to me getting help with that outside help and succeeding at beating that and becoming a successful student and stuff. You know, like I said, school is a big part of my story, and I dropped out of high school, and I practically dropped out of fourth grade. You know, I, uh, I threw out my homework every day for, like, a while until mom found it. No, that was... That was second grade. I started throwing out my homework in second grade. That was my another early form of drinking was like, homework? I can't do that. And it wasn't alcohol yet, but it was just one more lie. One more lie. One more day I'm going to throw out my homework. And I got caught. And I'm really good at sweet-talking teachers, you know, and I've always been like, I've always had one more chance. And so second grade, from the gate, it's like, oh, you're, you're going to be held back from third grade, you know, and I was like, oh, please, I'll be good from now on. I promise I'll never do it again. I'll do my homework. And, and I almost got held back from third grade and somehow I passed. And that was also early on. I heard like, oh, you have so much potential. If only you'd put your mind to it. So to some people, if you hear you have potential, you can be whatever you put your mind to. That's like a blessing. You'd be like stoked. Thank you. You know, I can do whatever I want. 
But to me, it was like, you can be anything, be everything. And I was like, fuck, what am, what am I supposed to do? Like, tell me to be a garbage man. Tell me to be an electrician. Tell me to clean toilets. I don't know. Just tell me something, you know? So it was, it was this, this sentence on me. And it was like, Jeremiah would be so smart if only he could pay attention. And to someone that can't, like, chemically or physically can't pay attention, it just doesn't work. And alcohol really helped that eventually. And actually, white powders helped that eventually, too, because <laughs> I self-medicated, and I'd draw the best drawings, but then, like, I would not be able to stop it good enough, and it'd just be a blob by the end of the night. But, you know, I love drugs, and I love alcohol, and they were my solution. They're not just the problem. If it was still fun, if I could still tie one on and, like, I don't know. I want to say if I could still tie one on, I would, but I don't. With 17 years, I don't want to drink a beer. That sounds stupid and boring to me, like a waste of beer. I was, I was in Santa Cruz where I live today getting a burrito with a friend. And this girl was having a beer, and she, like, got up with it. And I was like, oh, my God, is she going to throw that out? Is she not going to finish that? It was like, how, what, how do you not finish a beer, you know? And I, probably you guys can all relate, but it's like there is no one for me. And now, even if you could tell me right now, you can go drink tonight. I would have like five right away. Like, fuck yeah, let's do this. You talked about 40s. I loved 40s growing up. You know, I thought I was gangster. Like, I'd <laughs> hang, out, hang out at Provo Park drinking 40s. And like, hear, uh, what's his name? Ice Cube talking about St. Ives. And I'm like, yeah, St. Ives is my brand, you know? And <laughs> play dominoes. I'm actually really good at dominoes because I learned a juvie because I'm hardcore like that. And all the essays taught me domino. It's not funny. This is serious. <laughs> no, like, I got arrested on... My birthday is April 29th, so it's coming up in 10 days. And in 1992 was the Rodney King riots. And one of my cousins got in some trouble for clothing that wasn't hers coming out of the gap. I, on the other hand, was picketing and marching on the Bay Bridge, and I felt like, it was like drinking to me. It was like, fine, I belong, you know, because I come from a very socialist, progressive, left-wing uh, Jewish family, and my mom was very right-wing, conservative, kind of like her way of rebelling was doing what would be normal anywhere else in the country. And so, thankfully, that happened because now I'm the opposite. But, but, you know, I felt that day like I finally had arrived. It was like, I'm standing up for what's right. But I got arrested. And I remember my mom recognized me from, like, my, my sleeve. She saw me on TV. She's like, oh, hey, you were there. So, How'd you know, Ma? She's like, I saw your sleeve on TV. <laughs> Moms are weird like that, you know? They have this, like, sixth sense or whatever, but... I remember getting arrested and feeling like I'd arrived, and then, uh, and, and yeah, learning to play dominoes. Everyone else was playing basketball, and I was like, I don't play sports. <laughs> sports are for losers, you know? I'm a skater. I wasn't a skater yet, but I had the skater mentality before I ever skated, you know? But like, I don't do organized sports, like, whatever, go play basketball. So I learned dominoes, and I'm still good at dominoes today. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, 40s, dominoes. Like, I don't know. I'm going to fast forward some. When I came into AA, I couldn't stop drinking. And I couldn't stop sticking straws in my nose with lines of white powder on the other end. To me, it's like I drink and then bam, there's other substances in me. And I was on probation. I finally got caught. It was like, I've never been caught. I've never, I don't know, I had all these nevers. I'll, I'll never smoke crack. I did that twice. Sorry, guys. It was in weed, though, so it didn't count. <laughs> and I saw people sprinkling it, and I knew what it was, but I did it. And I remember being really high and being, Oi, don't ever let me do this again, man. Just, if you see me, do, just, just kick my ass if you ever see this. And then I came down, and I, like, started twitching, and I was like, I want some more of that. You know, and that, that was one of the last I never wills. And I say that to illustrate my alcoholism, because it's like, I will never do that. And as soon as I do it, the bar's lowered a little further, and it's like, well, that's okay, but I'm not a junkie because of this, or I'm not an alcoholic because of this, or I'm not, I'm not this because of that. There was always all these self-imposed rules and definitions for me, and I was constantly self-defining and redefining as to what I was using, you know, and, uh, what? 
So I got alcohol poisoning when I was 15, 15, which was like the beginning of my drinking. And it's really weird having my uncle Raphael in the audience with my cousin, because like, I just got to tell this and plenty of other stories, but this man is amazing to me. Thank you for everything. You know, I, I grew up without a dad and he was always there, like taking me on camping trips and being like, you know, just be careful, you know? And I aspire to be like him, and I get to be that way for my nieces and nephews and, and cousins, and just be like, dude, this is my story, you know, and not be like shoving AA down people's throats. Because I could think of some people that are not in this room that could probably qualify, but it's kind of like I've learned from my uncle, like just kind of do the deal, take them with you, and whatever happens will. And that's why I surf today, too. Surfing. I'm sorry, guys. Surfing is a big part of my story. <laughs> I got my first surfboard when I had two years. I was helping my uncle move, and he's like, "I'm really proud of you, son." Here, and I grew up going to the, I grew up going to the beach with this guy and and babysitting Alex. I'm sorry, I, that's so weird having you here, but I so appreciate it too. <laughs> you know, uh, I used to watch my cousin while my uncle surfed, and then I'd go boogie board. But I was always scared of surfing growing up. That's the truth. You didn't hear it from me, though. It was always like, I'm, I'm, no, I'm, that's, that's big. The ocean's big. And people talk about higher powers in AA, you know? And, and I grew up, like I said, between Judaism and Christianity. So no matter who I sided with, somebody was getting sold out. And everyone's <laughs> either going to hell or I'm a bad Jew. Either way, like... God has it in for me, you know, but, but today my higher power is in the ocean and in the sunset and in, in going to look at pictures with my grandma and, and, you know, uh, see, hearing my grandma's laugh when I go visit her when she's like, <laughs> cause she kind of, uh, she like recognizes me, but doesn't quite know who I am. She's like, <laughs> I'm like, that's fucking cool. You know, like I get to show up for that today. And, uh, I realize I'm a little all over the place, but, you know, I used to not show up for anything. I was going to say earlier, when I came into AA, I was on probation because I finally got caught with drugs, and I was just going to drink. And like I said, when I drink, powders go in my body, and blotter goes in my body, and whatever I can get my hands on, if you've got it, I'll do it. Except for heroin, because I'm not a junkie. But, <laughs> but I did get this dirty E this one time, and I really, really liked it. <laughs> so it, that was that thank god is still a yet but there's all these yets that the alcoholic in me still wants to do it's like i just want to take it i just want to go big or go home and <laughs> but uh so i was trying to just drink you know and, and it wasn't working but i came into aa and uh there was skateboarding graffiti and raving and that was what i knew it was what i did and it's who i am those things were very important to me, and it was my identity. So those things all are still important to me in their own ways, but like, it came to a point where I was like, I have to be willing to give all those up. And it wasn't like I gave them all up right away, but it was like, if skateboarding is going to stand in the way of me getting sober, I'm willing to give it up. And that's big for me. I grew up in Berkeley with no car and no need for a car. I just skated everywhere, you know, and, uh, and graffiti, I still write on paper. And I actually took part in a art show at a friend's house the other day. He's a graffiti artist. And, uh, I take pictures now. I go to crazy old abandoned buildings and stuff. And I still get that gritty, like urban feeling, you know, but, but it's taken on a new form in my life. And the concrete hurts, so I surf now. <laughs> I actually still skate a little bit, but you know, I have a car now. I can drive to the beach. I live in Santa Cruz. And uh, I'm like trying to condense this into the usual like 15 minute format, but <laughs> I don't know. I was, I was also going to take notes just in case I like lose track or whatever of where I am, but yeah, it is what it is, you know, and uh, it's just amazing. It's such a ride. And I've been going through a tough time lately. My family's been going through a tough time lately. And about every five years of my sobriety, there's this time where I'm just like, I didn't fucking get sober for this. You know, when life gets really, really serious and I want to check out. I want to quit AA. I want to drink, but I don't want to drink. And I just, I got to do something, right? But I haven't checked out yet. I haven't killed myself and I haven't drank in 17 years. And that's huge, but it's also really simple. I talk to another alcoholic, 
I don't pick up a drink. And in fact, it talks in the big book about we, uh, we recoil from it as from a hot flame. Someone put a bud in my hand the other day, one of my coworkers, and I want to be cool. I want her to accept me. I want to have the, the camaraderie of like smoking together, but she put a bud in my hand and I was like, I don't do that. I put it back right away. And then afterwards, I was like, wait, I should have, like, saved that and given it to a friend or something. You know? it, was, it literally was a, uh, a reflex. It was like, I don't do that. And it's like my body does that or my mind does that before I even get a chance to think about it. And that's, that's important because those times arise. Some people say, like, oh, well, I got sober and I haven't had the thought ever again. And that's not true for me. Partially because I still like that culture, you know, hip hop culture, urban culture, skateboarding, surfing, all that, all the cool 20 something things to do or 30, whatever, you know, like where I grew up, it all involves drinking, like everyone out there drinks. It also says in the book, our alcoholic life seemed like the only normal one. And it still does seem that way to me, except in here, because like I said, we can all do together whatever we want to do, you know, like I spent my first four years sober going to raves, which I probably wouldn't suggest. I was in a lot of slippery <laughs> places. There were a lot of substances. It was crazy, but it was also really fun. And one of my friends from my old crew is still sober and has like a few years more than me. And, uh, but from the gate, I brought people with me, you know, I'd be like, guys, let's go to this rave. And this is going to sound really weird, but I would like hold hands and pray with them before, which I don't do anymore. <laughs> but I was always like, let's pray. And I'd go to the rave and I'd have fun. And it was great, you know. And, and part of what I've learned in sobriety is that my character defects have become character assets. Like when I moved around, when I was always the new guy, I was very adaptive. I was a chameleon. So I was able to slash force myself to make friends with people. And today, if I do say so myself, I'm really good at making friends, you know? And, and that's something that came out in a way of my drinking. So the funny thing is, like, you never know, or at least I never know, what my higher power has planned for me, you know? And uh, you talked about Paris, and I have a Paris connection. When I had four years, it was the first time in my sobriety where it was like, I didn't get sober for this. Fuck that. Because when I had three years, no, when I had four years, I hooked up with this girl who was new in AA, <laughs> and uh, she is to this day my longest relationship, but for a while we were just madly, madly in love, and I knew she was the one, like, this is it, like, I found her, you know, and, uh, and I was also going to move to Hawaii, because I had already at that point fallen in love with surfing, and every surfer goes to Hawaii, and I was like, my uncle has some friends out there, and I was going to move out there and just become, like, not even a plumber's apprentice, just someone that follows the plumber around, like his monkey boy, basically. But my girlfriend moved to Paris, and my brother got locked up at that time, and I just crumbled. I was between my friends John and Troy outside of Monday Night Young People's, snot pouring out of my nose, just fucking bawling. I was like, I can't do this. This isn't what I got sober for. And these guys are like barrel-chested Troy and Fireman John. Like, they're, they're alpha males, like really cool, but macho guys that you don't, I don't want to cry around, but I've been there in sobriety. I've been really ugly in sobriety. You know, like, I was just speaking at a meeting the other night, crying, and I'll get to that later, but, you know, it was when I had four years, it was like, this isn't what I signed up for. And the thing is, I didn't sign up for any of this. I signed up to get off probation and get my tolerance back. I signed up so that I wouldn't open my backpack and have random stolen pasta from a frat party. Like, that's what happened. I, I signed up for not waking up next to strange people that I normally wouldn't and telling them I got to go to work, even though I was totally unemployable, you know? I signed up for not having to worry about the cops in Berkeley, knowing me by name and always having to look over my shoulder and shit, it's the cops again. That's what I signed up for. And in exchange for that, I've gotten these moments of beauty, I'd say, where I've walked through really tough shit in sobriety. And one of them was my brother being locked up for 10 years. And he's out now. He's been out for like two or three years, but it fucking crushed me when he got locked up. And I totally blame myself. I gave that kid his first beer. It's all my fault. I'm a bad big brother, you know? Like, it was so on me. And my girlfriend moved. So it was just like, I'm, I'm done, you know? And I gave up. And, and I went to meetings. And I cried. 
And I called people and I hung out and talked till four in the morning or whatever. It was like, I don't know what to do, you know? And, and I got better. And I got to follow that girl to Paris. And we're not together today. And I still have love for her, but I'm so glad we didn't end up together. And I was even, I did the whole, like, what if we got married? You know, like I wasn't, I wasn't down yet to fully get down on my knees and be like, will you marry me? But I was, I was testing the waters already. Like, you know, well, what if we got married? And she kind of laughed and I was like, well, <laughs> but, but I hadn't traveled. So, so my cousin Alex here apparently was on this trip to Mexico with me a few years ago. I was telling him about this trip. Like, dude, this one time I was in Mexico. He's like, you fucker. I was on that trip with you, and he starts telling me all this stuff that I did, right? I was 16. As soon as we get to Mexico, I spend all my money on alcohol. No, alcohol, candy, and fireworks. <laughs> Fuck yeah, right? <laughs> and then uh, I had talked to my uncle's friend into going, and he had a big, his friend's nephew into going, and he had this big bag of bud. And so all I did the whole time there, I surfed once, and I got the tiniest little pebble cut on my foot, and I was like, I hurt myself. And I just <laughs> laid out on the beach and got wasted the whole time. And I'd like to say it was fun and little moments were fun, but most of it was just oblivion because I was 16 and I could drink like I wanted to drink, you know? And uh, that's the only traveling I did before I came to AA. That was it. I'm a Berkeley boy. Not born, but raised, you know? Like I was born in Humboldt. And besides all my many, many, many six month stints here and there in middle school, like, I just, I've always been a Berkeley boy, you know, so I hadn't really traveled. I didn't know the world. And, uh, and so I travel, I, I go to Troy and I'm like, dude, I, how, how do I buy a plane ticket? And I don't even think I had my own, I don't think I had my own computer at that time, but it was like, he showed me how, no, I did have a computer, <laughs> but, but he showed me how to buy a plane ticket. And then I went to the city and and Breeze was there with me, and, and I was like, um, Breeze, I need to borrow some money, and how do I get a passport? And, like, people <laughs> walked me through that stuff in AA. They were, I, I'm like, I don't know what to do. How do I do this? It's as simple as that. And I've applied that to school. I've applied that to jobs, and I've applied that to traveling. And so <laughs> for my 25th birthday, I was in this, in France. You know, I was, I was what? <laughs> I was on the River Seine watching the Notre Dame Cathedral float by in the moonlight. It was romantic as hell, and the girlfriend and I had a fight. It was horrible, but I was just like, I fell in love with myself, and I fell in love with God on that trip, you know? It was like, there were all these moments where I was by myself, and, and they talk in the AA, in the big book, about... There's going to be a time when the only thing between you and a drink is God. And for me, it was like the only thing between me and adventure was God. Because there's these moments where, like, I had a huge fight with her one morning. And then I went and got some bread. And I'm, like, walking through this canal in Paris with my Kangol hat on and my baguette under my arm. And it's sunny. And it's me and God. And it's like, this is, this is me. This is Berkeley Boy in Paris, France. Like, who would have thought, you know? And... and and then, yeah, the night of my birthday, we're floating down in this boat, <laughs> and I went and smoked a Cuban cigar and drank African espresso and had the most rich chocolate cake ever, and, uh, and that relationship didn't work out, but my, I'm so in love with traveling. It's been a while, and I really have the travel bug lately, but I've been to Paris, Puerto Rico, Israel, <laughs> Venezuela, Mexico, and I always feel like I'm leaving something out. And I got to go to, well, no, Alex, we got to travel again soon. <laughs> but Raphael and I got to go to Puerto Rico in sobriety. That trip to Paris gave me enough frequent flyer miles to fly to Puerto Rico for 20 bucks. And, uh, and yeah, and Raph's like, you want to go to Puerto Rico? I was like, oh, yeah. And we got family friends out there. So I paid 20 bucks and went out there. And again, it was that seat of the pants. I don't know what to do. How do I do this? Oh, my God. I'm going on this trip. What do I do? And then I go. And, like, it's these moments where I'm in this in this hammock, smoking a cigar with the uncle, watching the ocean and, and the sunset, and just being like, wow, here I am, you know, and connecting with him. And when I was using, I ran from that. Like, he was always there for me, but I didn't 
I wasn't there to have him there for me, if that makes sense. I always had the option of having a father figure around, but I just didn't have a dad, so I was running. And I had a mom, so I was running, you know? And, and then my stepdad came around, so I was running. <laughs> but in sobriety, I have gotten reparented by my uncle and my aunt, you know? And I, they're amazing to me. He's like <laughs> my best friend and my buddy, and he really nags me sometimes, but that's what father figures do, you know? And we surf together, and... and and we went to uh, we went to Alcatraz Island for Thanksgiving for the Native American powwow two years ago, and he's been asking me for years. And finally, I was like, "Dude, we gotta go!" So I went. I got up at four in the morning or something. The three of us went, and it was just amazing, you know. And 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 that's what I get to stay sober for today. And I've had a shit ton of death in my life. Like it's really fucked up. When I had six years. My mom got cancer, my aunt got cancer, and my 14-year-old sponsee committed suicide by ODing on antidepressants. And that was another moment, another long moment, a moment like months where I was like, I didn't get sober for this. Fuck that. Fuck AA. Fuck everything. I'm done. You know, and, and but AA carried me. I had a lot of phone numbers. I went to a lot of meetings and people knew me. And they're like, this kid needs help, you know? So right away, there was like six people outside of my door. And, uh, yeah, it's hard stuff to talk about and hard to live through, but my mom didn't make it because God was going to heal her. And thanks to AA, I was able to hang out and do her laundry every Friday, you know, and take my little sister skateboarding while we do mom's laundry. And, uh, and I hated my mom growing up. I threw things at her. I also love her deeply, but I couldn't stand her. She always had these fucking rules, you know? <laughs> and I couldn't listen to rock and roll because it's satanic. And I can't watch Scooby-Doo because it's satanic. And all this stuff that just other reasons why everyone else is better than me. And I'm not like you because I can't do what you can do. And, uh, yeah, I've gotten to make amends in sobriety for that. And I've gotten to be a son to my mom and to my aunt and uncle and a cousin and a brother to my cousin and, and it's big you know and I'm really lucky for that like it's easy for me to look at what I didn't have that made me run but I have a lot today and I have had a lot and I've also lost a lot in sobriety but it, it hasn't been enough for me to drink you know and uh is it really that time already whoa so really quick trippy story Rainbows are really important to me, right? When I had like, when I had five years sober, my mom had nagged me for two years, like, you got to go on this free trip to Israel. And I thought it was going to be some crazy religious thing. And they were going to get me, you know? So I was like, yeah, whatever, mom. And I found out my friend Moshe had gone on the trip. So I was like, wait, what? It's a real trip? I'm going to go. So I went and I got to go with Moshe. He was the, the group leader of the trip I was on, you know? And it was amazing. And I went to Israel We'll backtrack a little. My uncle was sick at that time. He had nerve sheath cancer, and I reached a plateau in sobriety where it was like, I didn't get sober for this. Or no, let me rephrase that. It wasn't, I didn't get sober for this. It's like, I got sober for this, but what's next? You know, it's like, I want to go to school. I want to help people, but how and for what? I knew I wanted to be an EMT or a nurse. So we go to see my, uh, my uncle in the hospital, and there's this... There's this place that I'm becoming all too familiar with. It's this place on people's deathbeds where you like, what do you talk about? Oh, what's up? What are you going to do next week? Like, how's it going? You already know all those answers. So I just started talking to him about surfing. And then I was like, yeah, you know, I, I got to do something. I want to help people. Like, what do I do? I want to be a nurse or an EMT. And people started chiming in and they're like, oh, well, if you're a nurse, then the pay sucks at first. And if you're an EMT, then the hours are going to be long. And my uncle laughed at me and he looked through me, not at me. He looked to wherever you go when you die. And he was like, don't listen to them. They're your family. You can do whatever you want if you just put your mind to it, you know? And that's exactly what I heard as a little ADD kid. You can do whatever you want if you just put your mind to it. But it was a curse then. And those were my uncle's last words to me. And his funeral was a little while after that, you know? And uh, I was just thinking about how wrong this world is, you know? How I'm the alcoholic. I'm the addict. I'm the one that fucked up so much in life. And my uncle's dead. And that's not right. 
And right when they started lowering him in the ground, a rainbow spread across the sky because it started raining. And that was like my uncle's soul, you know, like smiling, saying, it's okay. I'm safe now. And, and uh, I went to Israel right after that with Moshe and a bunch of other kids, a bunch of crazy college kids, you know. And, uh, and after the funeral, my friend had said, that's amazing. Now, whenever you see a rainbow, you'll think of your uncle, you know. And I was like, yeah, you're right. And so I go to Israel, and the first day there, we go to Mount Masada, the King Herod's palace ruins. And usually you can hike up the mountain, but uh, that day, for some reason, we had to take a gondola up. So I go up the gondola. There's like six people in it. With me. So I get out of the gondola. All of a sudden, I'm alone. It's that place of solitude again. It's me, God, and traveling. And it starts raining, and there's a rainbow across the sky. And I'm like, right where I'm supposed to be. And it's like, I can do this. I'm where I'm supposed to be. So, yeah, I just don't drink when people die. And I don't drink when I get a diploma. And I don't drink when I go to the club, and I don't drink when I surf. And that might sound really simple, but the secret is, it actually is, if I don't pick up that first drink, I can go through anything in life. And what I get is so much more than what I came in here for. So, yeah, um, thank you all for being here. Thanks for keeping me so. Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. Sobercast is ad-free, and we'd like your help in order to keep it that way. So if you'd like to help us be self-supporting by pledging a dollar to a month, visit Sobercast.com and look for the donate links. Thank you very much.